Um, we don't have a visitor's packet, <laughs> and we're not going to make you stand up and tell where you're from, but we're glad you're here as a visitor. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> but I have to admit that our dear church secretary, Laura Slater, does go around and ask you if you're willing to have your name registered. And she's on, on the ball for that. And if she missed you, uh, she'll be more than glad to talk to you. Um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And already this morning we have experienced the fact that God is for us. God is our strength. He is a shield about us. Amen. Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me. How I glorify in that and how we rejoice in the music that we're given together. Um, I want to remind everybody, because you may not read your bulletin, that we are having a Thanksgiving service for a number of churches that are participating at the Hampton Inn next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. It's in the bulletin. There's going to be social distancing and all the other stuff that seems to be important to people. <clears throat> but right now, there's five churches that are going to be there. One of them, we're one of them. And it's just going to be a time of testimony, of praise to God, of reading scripture, of singing. It's just going to be a glorious time of giving thanksgiving. And indeed, like the video said, we ought to be thankful. Amen? We read these words from the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And I set a watchman over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregations, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people. We know the way, and we will walk in it. We hear the trumpet, and yet we will not hear it. There's a challenge to us in this day and age We've experienced that in this election we just went through, and we continue to experience it. There is a real good, a way that leads to life, and there's a real evil that is predicated on the Bible and speaks about the devil's desire to take over and be God. And we'd better believe it. Jeremiah, whose name means Jehovah has appointed, is prophesying impending doom on Judah and the holy city Jerusalem. They have strayed from the ways of the Lord. They have become brazen in continuing in their disobedience. So God gave them watchmen, and the watchmen blew the trumpet of warning about judgment coming. And what did they say? Don't bother us, we won't listen. Well, the Hebrews built watchtowers in the fields of ancient Israel to guard their crops from animals and thieves, and they manned them with watchmen. And, and these same watchmen were placed on the walls of their city to warn them about impending danger from an enemy. Likewise, watchmen were set down into their cities to look after the people. But most importantly, the watchman was a prophet who observes the lies and behavior of God's people and calls out sin. So it is that Jeremiah prophesies to keep the ancient paths the good way. Jesus taught the same thing. You remember Jesus preaching to the people and saying, enter 
the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way it is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Matthew 7. In, other, in our world, unfortunately, good is negative and evil is positive. So much is preferred by people to walk in the paths of wickedness rather than the paths of righteousness. That's the plight of man. That's the reason Jesus came, to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, some of us may have feelings about this. Well, I'm not so bad. No, you aren't. You aren't so bad. But there's a problem. And the problem is sin. You say, well, I'm not really a sinner. Well, I suppose I am, but I'm, I'm not really a sinner. Yes, you are. <laughs> because you do not follow the ancient paths which God has established. We, we go on our own way, don't we? The, Isaiah says that all us like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. Whose way are you following? Yours? We're gods. You say, well, pastor, I have to follow my way because I have a job and I have to do these things and I'm responsible for doing all of that. Well, what gives you the energy and the strength and the life to pursue that? God Almighty. You see, Christians understand this. The world at large doesn't. And now the great debate that we have in our nation is excluding God. And what people are saying is, this is what we believe. This is our way. I remember as a boy reading Alice in Wonderland. And in there, the Alice is speaking to the Cheshire cat. Now, not everybody's read that, so just humor me, okay? But she's talking to the Cheshire cat. And she says, I'm trying to find my way. And the Cheshire cat gives her the response of our culture. Your way? Always around here are the queen's ways. Always around here are the government's ways. You see, as believers, we must take Jeremiah seriously when he's talking to us for the Lord about the ancient ways. The ancient ways are the narrow ways. We pastors are watchmen. And we cry out to God's people a warning. We're blowing the trumpet of God's judgment against our nation, which is now bathed in sin. Now just consider what is good, that which maintains God's biblical standard, that which is the ancient way. Uh, just follow and think about what is good and evil about the things I'm going to mention. Abortion on demand. Same-sex marriage and depreciating the nuclear family. The homosexual lifestyle. Limiting religious freedom by prohibiting the freedom of assembly. Removing a citizen's ability to defend himself. Removing the police and moderating the rule of law protecting the environment before the needs of people. Hey, we're blowing the trumpet, folks, but not, not many are listening. Uh, th this is what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Peace and safety is the mantra of progressive liberalism. These false prophets win people by telling them what they want to hear and saying, oh yes, you deserve to have peace and safety, and we're going to see that you have it. They believe that anything and everything that impacts peace and safety needs to be regulated, controlled for the sake of the poor, dumb masses, you and me. 
And so the watchman blows the warning trumpet, but they aren't listening. God appointed the prophet Ezekiel, which means God strengthens a watchman in the house of Israel. Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from this wickedness way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wicked ways or from his wickedness, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered yourself, again, you have delivered yourself because you warned him. People don't think about this, especially us Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans, but we pastors are on the spot. We have an obligation to warn God's people. I remember years ago, Billy Graham was interviewed about the state of the nation, and he said, quote, if we do not seek to repent for what our nation is doing, then God is going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, listen, I'm a human being like you. I have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. And I have to deal with that all the time. But the spirit of God that dwells within me reminds me daily and directs me daily to walk in the ancient way. To follow the direction of the Lord and not the direction of men. You all have this. You have this strength in the spirit if you will listen to him and follow him. And and when it comes time to take a civil action, like when we go to the polls, vote for the ancient way. Don't vote for this progressive liberal nonsense. Peace and safety. Yeah. Yeah. How about justice and righteousness to the glory of God? My training in wildland firefighter helped me to get a real grip on what it means to be a biblical watchman. Fire can be a fierce enemy, as we've experienced in the Rodeo Chetiskai fire in 2002, and any of you who are here remember that. The U.S. Forest Service has what they call fire orders. These were compiled over the years from fatalities on the fire ground. And central to these fire orders, and given as an easy way to remember them, is what's called lysis. Lookouts, communication, escape routes, and safety zones. Lookouts are watchmen. And what are they looking for? The danger of the fire coming in, the danger to our culture and to our well-being that the devil is propagating, the danger and the crazy, unbiblical thinking that's going on in our society right now. You say, well, pastor, I can't do anything about it. How about praying about it? And, And let's remember, our Lord Jesus Christ did not come to judge, but to save. When we lift up our prayers to God, we don't ask God to rain down fire upon all the progressive liberals. We don't do that. God loves them too. What we pray is, Almighty God, be merciful to us as a nation. Forgive us for the sins that we are committed and then name them as you understand them. And give us opportunity to be redeemed 
Forestay the day when judgment might come upon us. And dear Lord, deliver us from being like Israel who would not listen when the trumpet was blown. You say, well, it's too hard for me to be good. It takes some effort. You know that. Is it worth the effort? Amen. Glory to God. It is worth the effort to be good. How do we know what's good? Try reading this. You see, we're given a map. We're given a direction of what's good. We know what the ancient path is. The ancient path is that one given by God to Moses in the books of the law, right here. The the ancient path is the one expounded by the prophets who said, thus saith the Lord. That ancient path is, is the one given by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living word of God. We know what is good. We've been taught that. We've heard that. We're aware of that. And as believers, when we enter into a situation and we choose to lean towards that which is evil, the Spirit restrains us. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be thinking this. You shouldn't be taking this direction. You see, Jesus was calling us to be like him. Don't you realize that Jesus is the perfect image of what God intended for man to be? Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 48, that we're to be perfect even as God is perfect. You say, well, I can't achieve that. Jesus is teaching us that in him we have the promise that we can attain that perfection. And it's a process. And we're in that process. And the more that we walk in the ancient ways and the paths of righteousness for his namesake, the greater the opportunity to experience what is good. Believer, your eternal life began the moment you received Christ. You're in your eternal life right now. We're living that right in this moment. And we need to be excited about that because eternity is so long and we're going to be able to spend that in the glory of God in his presence and with him. Is it not worth that we should do what is good here and now? We read in the Acts that Jesus went about doing good. Jesus didn't spend time criticizing the Roman government. He didn't spend time complaining about how difficult it was to make a living. He didn't spend time in whining and complaining and carrying on about all the stuff that happened. Jesus spent time proclaiming the kingdom of God and that which is good. And shouldn't we do the same? In case you haven't got it, I'm blowing the trumpet here. Are you listening? (laughs) Going back to Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land... And the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. Then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood is going to be on your head. There it is again. And and then the text says, but if he hears the trumpet and and you have done your part and blown that trumpet and and he is delivered, then you are free and his blood is not upon your head. Ezekiel was dealing with Israel as the other prophets. A prodigal son of God, this people, Israel, 
following its own way, doing his own thing, believing his own ideas, and stepping out of the ancient way. We need to reconsider <clears throat> what these ways are in our life because Jesus told us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what is that way? Jesus honored all of the teachings that God brought to us in the Old Testament. He honored, for instance, the sanctity of marriage. As soon as we hear about alternate lifestyles, the warning bell should go off in our minds and our hearts should be made alert that evil is crouching at the door. You say, well, pastor, are you making judgments on those who have alternate lifestyles? No more so than Jesus did on all the sinners because he came to save, not to destroy. He came to free and not make captive. But you see, sooner or later, because God has given us free agency, we're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to walk in the ancient way or are you going to walk in the new way created by man? And excuse me, the progressive liberals. Oh, this is indeed a challenging time. And now is the time for the pulpit of Jesus Christ, the place where the word is proclaimed, to begin to say, people of God, listen, the trumpet is blowing and we need to begin to pray and do whatever we can to resist this horrible encroachment upon the truth in our lives. I'm reminded of Jesus' separation of the sheep and the goats. And the goats cry out, Lord, when did he see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then Jesus answered saying, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Goats do not know the ancient way. And when the trumpet sounds, they do not hear. What are we? Sheep or goats? Let me make this as clear as possible. Our nation is divided between what is good and what is evil. It does not have anything to do with political parties. It doesn't have anything to do with philosophies. We're divided between what is good and evil. This is the devil's plan to defeat us and destroy us. How shall we know the difference between the two? Now that's a good question. First, the Bible teaches us let our minds dwell on those things that are true, honorable, and right. Minds filled with anger, lies, judgment, and revenge do not qualify. Neither do minds filled with pride and hate. You say, but pastor, these people are so obnoxious and so difficult to deal with. I know that. But I'm not asking that you decide what you're going to do. I'm saying, what would Jesus do? And he gives us the strength to do that. If we turn to Galatians. <coughs> chapter 5. We get another clear example of what is good and what is evil. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. 
For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. Did you get that? So that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Are you ready? Which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. I have to hesitate there on sorcery. Do you realize that too many Americans, large percentage, read their horoscope, go to mediums, participate in the dark arts? Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's evil? There's a clear statement. Are you falling into any of those things? What about outbursts of anger? Jealousies. Disputes. Factions. It's got politics written all over it. Ah, but then... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those are things that are good. Do we have such a hard time in recognizing the good and the evil? Do we have such a hard time in walking in the ancient ways which the Bible has given to us consistently over time and who our Lord Jesus Christ certainly gave us a clear picture? This is what Jesus said if you want to really know what goodness is about. You have heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother is guilty already. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, he who looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. You have heard it said, you shall not make false vows. But I say to you, make no oath at all. And Jesus further says, let your yes be yes and your no be no for anything else is of the devil. We're blowing the trumpet here, folks. And Jesus continues, you have heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, but I say to you, resist, do not resist him who is evil but turn the other cheek. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I could go on for another 10 minutes with what Jesus says is good. And you, you see, it's a challenge to us. And, and then again, we come to the point, we say, but I can't do that. I'm only human. <laughs> The great excuse. I'm only human. Yeah, yeah, God knows that. He knows that for all of us. But you see, that's the reason Jesus said, I send you another helper. Amen. And we have the Holy Spirit. Now, just a quick word about the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He's not an it. He deals with us personally. Jesus said that he would send him to us, but we have a part in this. He writes, he says in the, in the Gospel of Luke, 
What's, what father among you, if his son asked for a loaf, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a scorpion? How much more will your father who is in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you'll ask? And we need to ask. You say, well, nothing happens when I ask. Well, <laughs> where's your faith? You see, the word says that. So we've received the Holy Spirit. What is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? The key manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and you need to understand this, especially all you Pentecostal brothers and sisters who are here, the key manifestation of the Holy Spirit is love. Paul spent... 1 Corinthians 12, speaking about all the gifts. And at the end of that, he says, but I show you a more excellent way. And then we have 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about love. That is the more excellent way. You want to be in the Spirit? Ask God. Seek a filling of the Spirit. And then what needs to happen is you need to love one another even as Jesus has loved us. And then you will be gifted as God so determines. These are supernatural things. These are things that can only be understood through the power of the Spirit and in His presence. But we need to receive them in this day of great testing, this day when good and evil are standing juxtaposed to each other and we're being called upon to make a decision. Going back to Ezekiel. Yet your fellow citizens say, the way of the Lord is not right. When it is their own way, that is not right. That's what it says right here. This is Ezekiel. They say the way of the Lord is not right, but our way is right. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, then he shall die in it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and practices justice and righteousness, he will live by them. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not right. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to your ways. So what's your way? Is it Jesus? Or is it your way? Is it some other way? Have you been trained or taught as you've been growing up or, or in your work environment that your way is better? Have you been taught to follow the Lord? It's good and evil, folks. We just went through a season of experiencing that. And God be merciful to our nation, and all those who in ignorance voted for evil. And so this is what Jesus said. Come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Glory to God, hallelujah. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your great majesty and direction in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your righteousness and your justice. And, oh, Lord, how we lift up our nation before you. Lord, deliver us from the slippery slope that we're on and help us to return to the ancient ways. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.